difficulties. Um, thanks for joining our first ever virtual financial budget forum, uh, FUS budget forum. Uh, we have a full agenda with uh, you know multiple speakers on stewardship topics, and then Monica will lead us through the details of our proposed budget, and we'll save some time for questions at the end. And I think Monica is going to start us off with some Zoom meeting logistics. I will, I will. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things. First, we have, as I mentioned, the board member and finance committee rep, Creel Ziering, uh, as our primary Zoom administrator today. So she's going to help ensure that everybody stays on mute. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in the chat section uh, to keep things moving along rather swiftly. And um, in case you didn't already stumble across them, we have two handouts available for the meeting. Uh, there's an update from the foundation, um, who we'll hear from at the parish meeting on May 31st, and an overview of the proposed budgets. So you can find those on the homepage. Uh, just click financial form information. There's another button that says meeting documents. Uh, those are combined into just one master document. So you'll see it, the second foundation stuff if you just scroll down. Um, all right, I think we are ready. Everybody's ready? Okay, we're gonna hand things over to Doug and Kelly for an opening reading and an introduction. All right, thanks. Our opening reading is from Gretchen Haley. For this one moment, know only that you are loved, that you are whole, holy, and loved. Know that you belong here, here among us, here upon the earth. However tired or broken your heart may be, whatever fear, disappointment, anger you carry, for this time know you are not alone. Feel the presence of others surrounding you, breathing beside you and with you. Discovering together the way our voices rise and fall in harmony, in hope. Claim here a resilient freedom the choice for love, for light, to live with joy and gratitude and praise, to believe in community, in connection, in one another, as a form of resistance, even now, even now. Thanks, Kelly. So we wanted to take a few moments as we moved into this forum for your clergy team to make sure that you knew that we acknowledge the extraordinary realities that we are coming together and talking about the finance forum in the midst of a time unlike any other. And we want you to realize that we understand how deeply and powerfully the virus has already impacted all of our lives. The changes that have happened in our lives, the, um, the sometimes very personal ways that COVID has impacted you. Um, we know that many of you have already had that virus impact directly in your lives, and that many of you, if not almost all of you, um, have anxiety about finances, and that many of you have had your financial realities impacted deeply already. And, and so it is important today for us to be transparent and in conversation about our finances, here at First Unitarian Society. But what is most important is that you know that we remain a community of support and connection in this time. This is your spiritual home, especially if you are struggling, especially if your world has become a very difficult place. We need each other now. Perhaps more than ever, we need to remember that we heard in our opening reading, we belong here together. When we talk about financial responsibility, we always mean that each person decides what they can do in support of FUS based upon the realities of their lives that really only they can know. So please know and under, know that we hear and we understand the concerns about discussing financial matters during times of deep uncertainty and know that we are here and that your support ensures that we will continue to be here for you now 
and into the future. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly and Doug. All right. Well, on that note, let's get things started. Um, I shared in my article in the May edition of the Madison Unitarian that I have found tremendous comfort and inspiration in history these last few months. So it feels important to me to remember right now the resilience of our ancestors and in this institution, those individuals who have long since gone, who saw hard times, who bonded together, uh, and who remained committed and intentional about their vision for the future. So I have been craving opportunities to honor both those lives and the products of those dedicated efforts. So before we begin, I'd like to invite us to root ourselves by taking a moment to be grateful for all that's come before us. I think there can be tremendous power in reflecting both um, uh, reflecting on where we've been both in deep history and in the more recent past. So I want to invite you to stretch your memory back to almost a year ago. My experience with time right now is a little funky uh, in that things even three months ago feel a little more challenging to recall. In some ways, it feels like things before the Safer at Home order feel less relevant than say a month ago. Um, and perhaps the same is true for you. But all the same, I'm going to challenge us to think back over the last year rather intentionally. I'd like us to think about what at, FUS, what at FUS influenced us in the last year in regards to how we think about our resources and our money. Um, so the team is finished for a number of things that have influenced us and some of the congregants we've, we've been chatting with. And the pandemic is perhaps the first thing that comes to mind. It's definitely the elephant in this virtual room. And we will absolutely talk about that a little bit later in the forum. But for now, I'd like to encourage us to think of things prior to March. So the very first thing we're going to talk about are our UU partners. Um, so Doug is going to talk to us a little bit more about that. And there are many ways I actually could talk about that. But the main thing I wanted to let us know and remember is that for the last 10 months uh, or more, really, we this started even before that, um, the First Unitarian Society has been the beneficiary of a very generous spirit from the Unitarian Universalist Association itself in the form of them offering us some of its best leaders in stewardship and some of its most successful and dynamic fundraisers in um, to meet with us monthly via Zoom, uh, especially the staff members who work most closely with the financial health of the congregation. And this team included some of the regional leads from all over the US and UUA staff. And they sort of tried a pilot project with us where they offered for a year to meet with us and support uh, our financial health at no added expense uh, on our part. And so this was a really incredibly generous gift where hours and hours of their resource was offered in uh, sharing advice, um, giving us moral support and cheerleading us through sometimes some very difficult decisions and connecting us with resources that we might other, otherwise not have known about. Uh, but really what I think is most important for the future is that they offered a bridge to us, hoping that we in the future will partner more meaningfully with the Unitarian Universalist Association. And they gave us an insight into what some of the other best practices that larger congregations use in stewardship as well as giving us uh, some idea of what uh, our best and brightest ministers right now are thinking in terms of stewardship practices and what we might expect when you attract one of those best and brightest to be your future minister. So they really have built a bridge for us to ground ourselves in the larger movement of Unitarian Universalism. And it just really has been an incredibly generous act that we received from them. And we wanted to make sure that you knew that that really has benefited us amazingly over the last months. Thanks, Doug. 
Um, next, we have the stewardship ministry team, which was officially formed this year in August. Although many of the members have been making their mark on the stewardship department for years. Uh, behind the scenes, we have Dorit Bergen, Matthew Doyle Olson, Steve Goldberg, March Schweitzer, Alice Deliquest, and Connie Beam, working with Cheryl Mellenfine, all of whom have been taking time to share what they know of our congregation, their areas of expertise, um, and have been helping us modify our stewardship practices accordingly. So Cheryl, do you want to say a couple of words about the stewardship ministry team's efforts? You might have to unmute yourself. Like you. Cheryl. There we go. Thanks, Monica. Hey, thank you. And thanks to the team. I think most of us are here. Um, I think we're incredibly fortunate to have this team working to do both the, the long work of transforming FUS into a community that fully embraces um, concepts around abundance. And then also um, the more immediate work through programs that we have implemented and projects um, to work on some of the best practices that we've learned that we've learned from the UU partners and then for us to, to learn um, and what it feels like to live more generously and I'd like to thank them so much for all the things I've learned from them in their long tenure here at FUS and looking forward to um, this next year and all the things that we can build on together thank you Thank you, Cheryl. All right, Terry is going to remind us all now of the fall parish meeting um, and how it impacted how we think about a culture of abundance. Yes, in our fall open question parish meeting, we explored the uh, sense of abundance we see here at FUS. And for this conversation, we used the framework, and I'm just going to read the definition that we used um, at that time. A culture of abundance happens when a community grounded in a sense of gratitude for the gifts of their lives lives with generosity, realizing that together we have enough. And in that spirit, we pose to the group, uh, where do you see abundance at FUS? And in what ways could we increase the sense of abundance here? Uh, some of the themes that emerged in that conversation were an appreciation of um, intellectual depth, our, um, our history as a congregation, um, many small group settings interact with each other, um, ways of, uh, you know, ways of kind of opening up the, uh, expanding the sense of abundance. Um, one thing that seemed a little bit more theoretical at the time, uh, people mentioned the possibility of virtual and online gatherings. <laughs> we are certainly, certainly exploring that now. Um, and other, um, you know, people had a lot of really interesting suggestions for, um, for other ways to interact. Uh, the Board of Trustees has been reviewing this information and we're looking at um, ways to continue um, the conversation throughout the year. Um, and in coming months, it will certainly be, um, certainly be virtual as the, as the format for those conversations. Someone is feeling mighty creative. That wasn't me. I don't know who it was, but looks good. Thanks. Um, and we could also remove it if anybody feels so inclined. I don't know how, though. So we'll just move forward. Um, so in November, um, we held the Close the Gap or initiated the Close the Gap campaign. I think it was an important mo moment for the congregation. Um, for me, it felt like a testament to being transparent about financial challenges and sharing that information with the community in a timely fashion that allowed for a meaningful change to occur. Instead of trying to solve the problems behind the scenes or solely among staff by cutting expenses. For you all as members, I hope it resulted in a sense of pride that together we were able to meet the goal and help us maintain the same level of programming and staffing from which we currently benefit. And I think um, for better and for worse, that muscle memory of generosity in times of need will likely come in handy this year. So in December, uh, Doug and I offered a class for all congregants that was based on a UUA curriculum, The Wisdom Path. So about 15 of us explored both our own personal relationship with money, as well as learning about our fellow congregants' money stories. 
Uh, for me personally, the process of preparing for the class helped me clarify some of my more deeply held beliefs about managing money. So for example, I've been robbed uh, several times in my life and I, um, I believe that probably played a part in my interest in doing best uh, or worst case scenario planning with finances. Um, fortunately, that tends to behoove me, uh, but left unchecked, I think it can inhibit things like generosity. Things like, like this had never occurred to me, um, and so I'm incredibly grateful for the wisdom path, um, the feedback that we received from, from those individuals that were involved with the, with the curriculum were very positive, and I would um, highly encourage anybody who's interested in this to either explore the curriculum on their own or, or come um, uh, come find me and we can maybe find a way to do it together at FUS in the future. All right, so those um, were some of the things we feel have influenced us um, uh, it, to the greatest degree in the last year. Uh, we're a little bit warmed up now, so let's uh, dig into financials uh, year to date as of March 31st, 2020. Um, we're also going to review together 10 events that had relatively significant fiscal impacts. You can read more about our year-to-date financials if you're interested in the May edition of the Madison Unitarian that is available on our website under the happenings menu. Uh, in this time of Safer at Home, we are trying to minimize the number of mailings that we're doing. So you'll notice your newsletter was emailed to you in lieu of a hard copy. If you didn't see that email and you'd like to, please don't hesitate to reach out to Brittany Crawford at brittanyc at fusmadison.org. All right, so you can see when looking at the Statement of Financial Activities Report that three quarters through the fiscal year, we're doing about $20,000 better than budgeted despite a net operating income amount of negative $35,000. So year to date in the operating fund, we anticipated $1,383,000 in income and $1,437,000 in expenses, projecting a deficit of $54,000. Ultimately, our actual income fell a bit short of the year to date budget by about $19,000 with $1,364,000 received by March 31st. And our expenses, thankfully, were under budget by approximately $38,000, uh, with a total of $1,399,000. So let's uh, walk through the fiscal year to point out a couple of events that had a larger impact. Uh, first, as many of you heard at the winter parish meeting, an August storm resulted in FUS being hit by lightning which damaged a number of our systems, including the atrium audio and speakers, uh, the fire alarm, telephone system, and door controllers. All systems were repaired or upgraded. Uh, we received $43,000 in other operating expenses from the resulting insurance claim. And there's approximately $13,000 in expenses connected to that claim. So reflected in the year-to-date year -date financials, there's a, a net of $30,000 from this. All right, next up in September, the Board of Trustees was honored to have a weekend governance retreat with Dan Hotchkiss um, to review our governance structure and to focus on how to effectively implement strategic planning moving forward. We invested a little bit over $4,000 in, um, in this board development uh, this was not something that was included in the original approved budget. It was an opportunity that came along afterwards. Uh, back billing, October. So in October of 2019, we learned that for the last 10 years, the village of Shorewood Hills has only been billing us about 10% of our water usage in the B wing. Uh, that was a result of a faulty meter that they had installed. So since then, our bills have looked about six to eight times higher than they had been. We um, promptly were provided a back bill of $2,000, could have been worse, um, which we promptly and begrudgingly paid in full. 
The Art Fair. Um, so in November, the Art Fair income reached an all-time high. Leslie Ross and the newly minted Art Fair ministry team uh, surpassed its net goal by $2,500. Its gross income surpassed its $13,000 goal by nearly $7,000, reaching the $20,000 mark this year. Uh, local business sponsors were pursued for the first time, which played a key role in the art fair's success. And then close the gap. Um, so as I touched on briefly before, in December, um, November and December, uh, we held the close the gap campaign in light of low pledges. At the end of the campaign, we had a total of 614 pledgers who had com uh, committed to a total of $1,107,000 in pledge payments, and 63 closed the gap donors who gave or committed to give $67,000. Those ranged in donation size from $12.50 to $25,000. So we recognize many of you in this virtual room dug deep and shouldered a larger amount than you had originally planned, and for that we thank you. Um, I was moved, as I so often am, by the many, many stories of heartfelt generosity in the Close the Gap campaign. Um, there were so many stories of support, but if you'll indulge me, I'd like to highlight one family in particular, the Deliquises. So many of you know the dynamic Deliquis family has been making annual stewardship pledges since 1999, for over 22 years. I think Alice was about 15 when she started pledging. Um, and of course, that's in addition to the overwhelming number of volunteer hours that they both have contributed over the years. Uh, we estimate that last year, Alice volunteered somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 hours to the stewardship department alone. Um, the Deliquises heard FUS's message last winter about the projected pledge deficit, and they answered with a beautiful gift, 75 5% above and beyond their annual stewardship campaign donation. Um, here's something that Alice recently um, said about her involvement. Cheryl's gonna, gonna read it for us. I can't see the whole thing, one second. FUS is the community that has called me to be my better self for over 22 years. Through belonging to FUS, I've gained tools to live a life of greater reference and to do so in service of a kinder, more just world. Whenever I join with FUS, others at FUS, or think of others, I have grown to know through my years of involvement, I feel a deep sense of hope. I walk in the door or log into F FUSMadison.org and I feel at home. Thank you, Alice. Thanks to everybody who pledged uh, or donated to the Close the Gap campaign this last year. It really made a tremendous difference. All right, five more events that we'll talk through. Um, computers. So um, in January, when we finished installing new computers for staff, due to a, a new security requirement, it was recommended that we upgrade all of our computers to Windows 10. Unfortunately, nearly none of our staff computers were capable of supporting that operating system. So we opted to get new computers for everyone. As a result, we exceeded the budget by about $2,000 for a grand total of $3,500, um, an investment that I think was well worth it. In February, um, on February 14th, we held the first inaugural Valentine Jazz Soiree, which raised over $7,500 in new income and hosted over 180 guests, a fair number of whom were from outside the FUS community. The Darcy Johnson Quintet elegant, elegantly blended requested jazz standards with stories of love and shared um, uh, uh, by our members for partners, children, and parents. It was a fabulous evening as well as a wonderful fiscal success. Snow. Um, so I shared in January at the parish meeting that the no show snow was good for the bottom line. Mother Nature did make up for some lost time in the third quarter, but uh, assuming we don't have any other snowstorms in May or June, 
we are assuming we will end the fiscal year uh, with about 5K of savings. And then mortgage, I'm very pleased to confirm that at the beginning of February, we did pay down $1 million of our commercial loan or mortgage. Thanks to the two and a half million dollars we've received to date in capital campaign pledge payments, as well as the roughly $750,000 from the hail damage insurance claim. So we were pleased to accept a refi with Summit Credit Union, our current banking institution. Um, they ultimately offered us the best deal of a 3.75 interest rate down from the previous 3.99%. Uh, which we've locked in for the for seven more years. Uh, we also opted to reamortize using a 25 year schedule in order to maximize annual operating savings. We will spend 45k less than budgeted in mortgage payments and look forward to saving nearly $110,000 for at least the next six and a half years. All right, last but not least, uh, for the last year, we've had the, uh, a million dollars collecting interest in a summit ultimate money market account, thanks to a wise recommendation from our finance committee. So with a 1.3% interest rate year to date, we've garnered over $13,000 in unexpected income uh, from the interest accrued. And now that we've paid down the mortgage, we won't see those types of, of returns, but it was nice while it lasted. And I think I'm okay trading that for the $110,000 in operating savings we'll receive um, from the mortgage. All right, so um, that brings us to March of 2020. So we wanted to tell you a little bit about what we've been prioritizing. Um, since we increased our awareness of the public health concerns connected to COVID-19. So Doug, Kelly, and I are going to do our best to provide an overview of five key priorities we've held over the last two months. Um, but first, I can't talk about the impact of uh, the pandemic on FUS without taking a moment to acknowledge how bizarre this all is. And for many of us, as Doug mentioned before, really devastating and traumatic. Um, the situation is incredibly challenging in such a variety of diverse and unique ways. And simultaneously, there is, as there has always been, lots of unexpected joy and beauty in this time as well. Um, as a staff, I'm really proud that we've done our best to honor that dichotomy and create space for that truth. Um, but now we'll start by talking about safety. Um, so. Safety obviously was our number one concern, especially as we um, as we entered this new era. Um, on March 8th, we made available a plans for coronavirus prevention and emergency response document. Um, this was a modification of a pandemic plan that we've had in place for over five years at FUS. The first item on that plan was to closely monitor the pandemic by following updates from experts at the local, state, national, and global level. We've done our very best to interpret and implement the best practices to the best of our abilities. Um, we increased the frequency and methods for facility cleaning. We've increased our communication in order to clarify expectations. Really, we aimed to center ourselves around how to care for the most vulnerable amongst us. Um, next, transitioning. So as the situation progressed, we quickly shifted our focus to transitioning ourselves into a virtual organization, first operationally and then programmatically. So we migrated to a cloud-based data management software and moved all bills, uh, all bill pay to online. We trained ourselves and some of you all on virtual communications like Zoom. And we tackled the barriers that staff were experiencing in working from home as quickly and creatively as we could. And fortunately, we were able to do all of that before the Safer at Home order was put in place. So next up, ministry. Kelly, do you want to talk a little bit about ministry in this time? Sure. Um, so you all know that we moved to virtual online services. Uh, our lay ministers really kicked into gear. Many thanks to them. Many are with us this morning or this afternoon. 
Um, they have a call list of about 200 of our elders that they are each checking in with each, you know, they each have their own little section of that list and they're calling and checking in with them regularly. And they've, they have learned um, many things about our folks, some who appreciate a weekly call and check in and others um, on the other end of the continuum who said between family and friends, I'm feeling over cared for at the moment. So thank you for calling and I will call you if anything comes up. So um, some very sweet connections and have been happening um, as well as our children and families made um, handmade cards to send to our elders in the retirement facilities of Capitol Lakes and Middleton Glen and Oakwood. So those were some sweet connections as well. Um, creating virtual opportunities. There are now Zoom meditation groups. The grief group and the caregiver support group have moved to meeting by Zoom. There is a new pandemic support group that meets weekly on Thursdays at 10 a.m. for anyone who needs a space to talk about whatever they need to talk about. Um, so that is a very sweet small group that is now happening Thursday mornings at 10 and we invite anyone who would like to join us who needs some support to please do. Those are all listed on the website. Our journey circles and chalice groups and book groups and men's groups, um, they all have Zoom links now and they are doing that work of connecting to one another and continuing to nurture their spirit over Zoom. So I, I think that's what we've been doing. Doug, you wanna say a few words about staff care in this time? Sure, I'd love to do that. Um, we have been working over the last months in general to, um, to improve the sense of staff morale, to have our meetings really try to be flexible enough to, uh, to help the staff engage what, uh, what is important in their lives uh, and to understand supervision as an opportunity um, to, to really help and assist our staff do their best job. And I say all that because as we moved into the pandemic, um, that foundation ended up really being an important thing that we could turn to uh, in our work with the staff specifically. Because uh, as we indicated in a very, very fast order, uh, every staff person had to revamp their way of doing things and their ministry um, intensely. And so one of the things that we emphasized before we moved into this time was the importance of um, having collegial connections both within the congregation, but also with the larger UU movement and also with other uh, Madison area congregations. And so we turned to those resources as we moved quickly into a virtual ministry. We learned um, from some of their best practices. Many of us on staff attended a Zoom meeting that was huge that um, invited various larger congregations to share some of the unique challenges and um, resources that work well with, with larger size congregations. And that was an incredible help. I know that regularly throughout the week, we turn to some of the ongoing resources that our colleagues uh, in every level of, in style of ministry have offered to us. But internally, we first of all made uh, a, a dedicated promise to our staff, as long as we are financially able to, to make certain that we um, continue to pay their salaries. Uh, it is unclear, uh, even in, Wis in Wisconsin, but certainly in other places, what level of uh, financial resource would be available to an employee within a religious organization. So we took very seriously um, that we really wanted to do our best. And again, big kudos to Monica for uh, immediately stepping up with a payroll protection plan uh, and making sure that we got that money to be able to do that. 
we meet um, three times a week. We meet for our usual um, staff meeting time, but we also meet two other times. Uh, it, it, for one thing, because really those virtual meetings are the only way that we remain connected with each other directly. We no longer have the opportunity, at least not very often, to safely meet one another here at FUS. Um, and we also use those two extra meeting times to review what we are doing in terms of offering virtual ministry and to step back regularly and make sure that we're finding out in a variety of ways what you need as a congregation and trying to continue to innovate and rethink what we offer. Um, and so we have really stepped up uh, to make sure that we are seeking to find ways to continue to serve you in this very quickly changing and often somewhat mysterious way of reaching out to you all. And so we remain open to hearing from you about what you need and we continue to work together to offer what we can to support you. I think that's my thought for now. Thanks, Doug. All right, the last priority that we'll discuss is the financial health, both of FUS, its staff and its members. Um, so in order to ensure that we can maintain our current level of programming and staffing, um, as Doug mentioned, I applied for the um, Small Business Association's Payroll Protection Program, the SBA's PPP. Um, pleased to share that we received just shy of $200,000 to support our efforts. So this loan with a 1% interest rate can be completely forgiven, becoming more like a grant than a loan if our staffing levels are maintained. Um, so we will be applying for that forgiveness in early July um, and expect to hear good news back before the end of the summer. Um, so we're also very closely monitoring income expenses and subsequent cash flow. Since March, we've seen a slight decline in things like parking income, mostly as a result of furloughed hospital employees. Um, our outreach offerings are down by about half. Uh, we do hope we'll see an uptick in this um, when we implement a text to give option this summer. Um, and on the flip side, there are areas where we're experiencing savings, like in programming and energy usage as a result of the building closure. Uh, we fully understand that we are in the midst of a global financial crisis, uh, but are still unclear the extent to which that will impact our microcosm of the community. So though national un unemployment levels are near 15%, we've only received three notifications to date after much outreach regarding modifications to pledges or pledge payments. So how hardly you all are hit and or how uncertain you are about your financial future will directly Im impact the degree to which FUS's financial health is impacted. Um, so as you well know, the annual stewardship campaign began two weeks before we went to virtual services, which has presented a very unique challenge. Um, so we wanted to share a snapshot of where we currently are um so the annual stewardship campaign for 2021 um, has a budget target of one million one hundred and ten thousand dollars uh as of may 15th actually we've received 433 pledges totaling eight hundred and ninety four thousand dollars so we have two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars left to raise in pledges um Gotta just move my screen, hold on. So last year, actually Cheryl, if you're available, I've, I'm, I'm, I have two screens and I can't see what's below. Do you wanna share the last little bit and then I'll chime back in? So last year at this time, we had 499 pledges totaling $969,000. So um, at this point we have 66 fewer pledges and $75,000 less in the pledge dollars than last year at this time. Which isn't terribly surprising, given that we are not in person, um, but it's obviously still of significant concern and something that staff and the finance committee, the board, the stewardship ministry team will all be monitoring very closely. So we will, of course, stay very transparent with you all about where we are um, 
throughout the summer likely, but definitely at the beginning of fall. And if we haven't yet met our budget goal, please know that we will um, very likely ask again for support, much like we did last year for the Close the Gap, um, so that we can avoid cutting expenses mid-year. Um, of course, as always, um, we are very grateful for those of you that have already pledged. And I'd like to call out one family in particular for their generosity this year. Um, I don't know if they know that we're gonna do this, uh, but the Ryan Joy family has been a wonderful example of stewardship. Um, Cheryl is gonna read a note for you all that they sent to us uh, about a month ago. Um, let me pull that up, here we go. Look at that family. Cheryl, you wanna share those words? Sure, thank you. Um, the First Unitarian Society provides our family with a spiritual home values that challenge all of us to be our best selves, and community that is supportive, loving, and fun. When we give back our time, talent, and treasure, it not only supports FUS, but deepens our own feeling of belonging in this community. We know that participating in the annual stewardship campaign supports our talented and resourceful staff, for whom we have been incredibly grateful during the COVID-19 pandemic. Being able to ground ourselves in weekly trans traditions and connect with this community virtually has been important to our family. And again, we want to thank the Ryan Joy family. We might have lost it for a second. Can y'all hear me still? Hello? Yes. Great. Oh, oh, good. So I think what Cheryl was saying is that we're very grateful to the Ryan Joys and everyone who's made a pledge to the 2021 campaign. Um, of course, if you haven't yet, please do reach out to Cheryl um, and do so as soon as you're able. Um, so before, uh, before we talk about the budget, um, I want to share one final thought. Um, I have been utterly awestruck, um, truly, by staff's creativity and commitment to our mission these last few months. I wanted to share just a quick overview of, of many of the initiatives, uh, a few of the many initiatives and programs that have been implemented, um, both for you, with you, and behind the scenes. So let's see, a little word art here. Um, so the June newsletter that you'll get in a couple weeks will aim to encapsulate for, your, for the readers, the diverse array of new initiatives that staff and lay leaders have been busy planning and implementing. Some of those uh, forward-facing things like the virtual services and the CRE classes and the bedtime stories um, have been really impactful as have things like creating grief boxes, which are given to those who lose a loved one in this time um, and AIDS um, aims to provide additional support for those that we can't physically comfort in their time of loss. We've also done lots that isn't yet visible to you, like painting the facility and upgrading our internet service. So huge kudos to all staff and their hard work. Um, if there's something that you all as parishioners feel that we're not doing, we really truly invite you to be in conversation with us. We'd love to know how to best support you in this really challenging time. Um, we, we recognize that our needs are ever changing. Um, so again, please do stay in communication with us. All right. Um, so there have been incredibly beautiful and heartwarming moments created in this time. And to that end, I wanted um, to take a moment to, to provide a little musical interlude and to allow you all to take a quick break and to me to refill my tea. Um, so Dan is going to help me play a clip. Feel free to listen uh, or again, take a, take a little stretch. This song is called Beauty in the Ugliest of Days by uh, Jonah Tolchin. And it's a little bit on the nose, but I think you'll forgive me for that. I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, Dan, let me know if I need to unscreen share. Let's yeah, if you can see. unscreen share, that'd be great. OK. Try pushing through, are you able? Hi, Dan. Or should I say Frazier? How's it look? We're still on your screen right now. 
Oh, we are, are we? Yeah. All right, give me a second, folks. Sure. Um, ah, there, it's behind my other screen. Stop share. There we go. Okay, okay let me get this video up. Okay, is everybody back? Well, I guess I should turn on my turn on my video. Okay. <sighs> Let's give people 10 more seconds to get seated. Okay, let's dig back in. Hope everybody enjoyed their break or the musical interlude. Um, let's dive into the budget for fiscal year 2021 being proposed by the executive team, the board of trustees and the finance committee. So first it's important to note that 
uh, budget is always our best guess for the future and its fiscal implications. Um, this is an incredibly challenging time to be trying to gauge what the future holds. So this budget does assume that services and the building will be um, slowly opening in the fall, but we recognize it could be much longer or shorter than this. And this assumption is not based on any decision that has been made officially by FUS, but rather the UUA's recommendation for making annual budgets this year. Um, overall, I feel we've been conservative with our projections, um, but that said, we are all open and committed to formally reassessing the budget after the end of the first quarter in October um, in order to reassess if further modifications should be made. So I'm going to walk us through the major areas to note in the operating budget before we move forward and look at the designated restricted fund and capital fund proposals. Y'all with me? All right, so first, looking at pledge payments line, you can see we've decreased our projected pledge income by $60,000 from last year, um, which is matching the actual amount of pledge income that we received in the 1819 fiscal year. So as I mentioned before the break, if we want to maintain our current level of programming, we need to meet our pledge goal. So we are committed to staying very transparent with you all about the status of our pledge campaign until that point. Rentals. So rental income from CSS, um, Shreeshamayam, the Meeting House Nursery School, and parking are all projected to remain stable uh, with small built-in increases. The meetings and events, however, have been projected to decline by about $3,000. The foundation. So we are very, very grateful for the foundation, perhaps this year more than ever. Um, you can see that we experience an increase as a result um, of their very wise investments. This is my cat, Moses. He is here to stay probably. Oh, hold on. Moses, darling boy. We'll see how long that lasts for. Um, so the more significant increases next year are for two of our reimbursable funds, the Wartman and Clay, uh, both of which have very ambitious programs planned. Um, we hope that you'll join us um, in enjoying those this next year. Next, collections and gifts. So considering the potential for more online virtual services, Next year, we've decreased projections for our offering by almost $15,000 and decreased our unpledged donation projection by about 3,500. So these both fall within the collections and gift line. Uh, next up is fundraising. So fundraising efforts, I think Mike might have asked this in the chat, um, fundraising efforts will, um, we, uh, we have the intention to have them include art fair, a cabaret, the Valentine soiree, and the select to, neck, select to connect in spring. All obviously have virtual plan Bs. Um, art fair's growth is in large part due to the business sponsorships, as I mentioned before. Um, and we hope that you all will support these fun fundraising events in whatever form they may unfold. The program, projected program income from class fees is projected to be about 8K lower um, than last year in light of the potential virtual landscape. We should all keep in mind that in essence, we now have a half-time adult education position due to the personnel cuts we made two years ago. Um, so we'd love to see this increased to a full-time position again as income allows, uh, but this decrease in staff does impact the amount of programming that we can offer. And then um, last in, in terms of looking at income for next year, uh, we continue to take strides towards balancing our operating budget independent from transfers uh, from cash reserves our designated fund and our capital fund, um, but we've decreased our fund transfers by $35,000 from 99,000 to 63,000 next year. So definitely a step in the right direction. 
expenses, personnel. So overall, our personnel expenses will increase by about 5K given the annual increase in paying for benefits. The compensation line decreased slightly due to a renegotiation of our contract with our accounting firm. We have not budgeted, unfortunately, for any salary increases this year. This unfortunately will be the third year without a cost of living increase for staff. And we are committed to reassessing this regularly, even mid-year, to see if circumstances or our financial outlook have changed. Uh, but in the meantime, with the national unemployment rates as high as they are, our primary goal as an employer is to keep all staff employed and do um, our best to provide a myriad of benefits, both tangible and intangible, to support their well-being. The mortgage. So next year's mortgage payments will decrease, as I mentioned, uh, by 107K from last due to the refinance, reamortization, and $1 million pay down um, that you all enabled. Thank you. Uh, without this generosity, today's conversation would be very different. The building. So our building expenses are increasing in the operating fund in part because we've discontinued a $10,000 budget for emergency capital projects in the capital fund. That's something that's been there, at, I don't know, probably about 10 years. Um, we've moved that additional $10,000 to the operating fund. Program expenses are projected to increase. Um, both the restricted expenses for the Wartman and Clay programs that I mentioned a bit ago are the primary source of this increase, um, as is the $11,000 um, expenses associated with our ministerial search. So those of you that were um, on the conversation with Keith Cron heard him outline between an $11,000 and $15,000 budget is recommended for that. Administrative. So administrative expenses do continue to increase annually, as, especially as we move to more cloud-based software uh, that enable us to thrive in the virtual environment. We are now completely cloud-based, meaning staff can do all of their work from anywhere in the world that is internet, um, from paying the bills to looking at pictures on our server from 25 years ago. Um, we're very grateful for our partnership with our IT firm, DaneNet, who helps ensure that our work is all done safely and securely. So that um, sums it up for the operating fund. So I will bring us into the designated and restricted fund proposed budget. Um, our projected income to the fund is estimated at 18,500 with about 18,000 for the music fund um, and the partner church program. Um, 2,600 in expenses will, uh, are projected to occur directly in this fund for partner church. And then in addition, we anticipate spending and or transferring to the operating fund a total of about $21,000, primarily to support the music fund. I'm sorry, the music program. Okay, so last but not least, the capital fund. So in the capital fund, things look much different than last year uh, as we enter the final year of collecting capital campaign donations and spending the last of the capital campaign fund dollars. We propose transferring $45,000 of support to the operating budget to support the mortgage as we have for the last decade. And um, if we receive the $230,000 in outstanding capital, um, capital campaign payments, um, then we'll have just under $400,000 in the unrestricted funds, the remainder of the insurance money we received for the hail damage claim um, makes up the majority of that cash projection. So we are proceeding very, very cautiously with the use of the remaining insurance funds. So with our mortgage payments made, um, I'm sorry, our mortgage pay down, we have less cash on hand than we've had in recent years. 
Um, and given the uncertainty of this year or the years ahead, we've been, um, we propose being very conservative in the use of these remaining funds. Um, remaining capital projects include remodeling the glass walkway by the partner church area, um, doing a number of beautification projects for the atrium and buying a new boiler. We, def uh, we propose deferring most of these projects until we have a better sense of our financial state. So with the exception of a handrail to the pulpit um, and doing some basic plaster work above the glass walkway to close the, gap, the gaping hole um, that remains, um, we suggest that we hold on to these funds to see, um, to see what the, the, a more immediate need might be. So in the meantime, the Board of Trustees has asked the Finance Committee to craft a policy about creating and managing a cash reserve fund. Um, so there you have it. Those are the um, three proposals for budgets for next year. Um, and I, at this moment, am going to hand things over to Terry. Um, we're nearing the present. We're nearing the end of the presentation portion. Um, so, Terry, do you want to do the honors of walking us through some of the things we hope your fellow members will do over the coming year? Sure. So one, as always, one of the most important things you can do is pledge. Uh, as Doug and Kelly mentioned, we know the pandemic is affecting all of our households in different ways. And there's a lot of economic uncertainty in general. And for many of us also in our personal finances. Um, to the, so to the extent that you're able to look ahead, please do make a financial pledge for the 2020-2021 year if you haven't already done so. Um, pledges allow us to plan and create the foundation for our budget. Um, and as always, if anything changes in your personal situation, um, you know, our staff and ministers always appreciate knowing this. While we're holding virtual services, it's still possible to contribute to our outreach offerings. Um, so from our FUS website, there is a very prominent link. If you follow this, um, there is an outreach offering option in the drop down menu that comes up next. And any giving with this designation will be shared 50 50 with that week's featured organization. So please continue to give to that, um, that important fund um, as you're able. There are a lot of ways to stay engaged virtually. It's changing all the time as we're all figuring, figuring out what works best um, for, for us as individuals and for our community. Um, so as Monica mentioned earlier, you know, please do plan to uh, virtually attend the fundraisers, um, at, whether those are in, uh, in person or in um, the virtual backup plan. Um, you are planning the art fair, the Select to Connect and other um, other ongoing fundraisers that um, provide um, opportunities to engage with each other as well as financially support our mission. And Kelly gave a you know, helpful summary of all the ways that, um, that people are reaching out. Uh, so please continue to do that. Please uh, you know, continue to reach out as individuals amongst, uh, amongst our membership and uh, you know, make phone calls to, to make sure people are doing okay. Um, I know there are a couple other um, specific initiatives underway. There are, uh, there, there are folks connecting across the generations as pen pals and uh, there are you know, a lot of things going on in small groups. So please continue to reach out. And if you're not, not already connected in some way, um, the staff and lay leaders can help you do so. And finally, um, I know it's kind of hard to look into the future sometimes as our, as our plans and situations seem, seem to change day to day. Um, but this is, uh, this is important to stay hopeful and keep dreaming about what we can do together as a congregation. 
Uh, so employing imagination and hope for the future is, is sacred work. It's a task that we are well equipped for by our participation in this spiritual community. So grounded in all that you have come to appreciate at FUS, let's take a few minutes to reflect on our hopes for the future. So we have an exercise um, that, you know, given our virtual setup, I think we're just going to do this individually. So um, we could take a few moments to, to reflect um, to ourselves. You can, you know, write something down if you'd like, uh, either, uh, you know, on your computer or with pen and paper, or if you are with others in the room with you, um, you can you know, reflect amongst yourselves. Um, but let's take just a couple minutes to uh, use our imaginations to look further into the future. You know, if FUS had unlimited funds and resources, what would you want our community to look like? I'm going to go on mute as we just sit with this for a few minutes. I'll gather us back together in about two minutes. All right, everyone. I hope that wasn't nearly enough time to contain all the dreaming. Um, thank you for indulging us um, as we continue to dream together and create a space that, um, that meets all of our needs and the needs of our larger community. All right, that concludes the presentation portion. Um, so I think we're gonna, Terry Creel, I think we'll do some, some Q&A now. We'll do our best to um, answer any questions you may have. I've had just a very minimal amount of time to look at the questions. Does anyone have, Terry, do you want to shout any out or Creel that, that were in uh, need of? One, one question that came up earlier in the chat, um, wondering if the ministerial search has had any effect or the ministerial transition has had any effect on our finances. Good question. Um, we did budget for the moving expense that's associated with bringing a new individual, a new minister, uh, interim minister here. I believe that was about five thousand um, dollars. We match what we um, what we the same thing that we budgeted last year, or I should say, two years ago. Um, in terms of thinking about pledges or income, um, I'll say very transparent. Apparently, no, it hasn't impacted how we think about um, or how we've budgeted for our income. Um, I think we are already being very conservative with the pledge income. So um, the only area that we are um, earmarking for the, the interim minister is in those expenses, the, the moving expenses. And I think we've, um, I think we've, this has come up before. I, I don't know if that was meant to, uh, that question was from um, Steve Goldberg, so feel free to unmute yourself as well. Um, 
and I think just on the the finances in general as well. Um, you know, I I think that you know is is it correct that you know what we're seeing is kind of uh, um, continued trends that have begun prior to the prior to Michael Schuler's retirement. Is that still still accurate? Would you say? Yeah, yeah. I, I hope you all, many of you, would have um, been present at last year's financial forum. We we showed a really I think impactful graph that demonstrated just the last eight years, um, just a, a slow and steady decline in terms of pledges and pledge payments. Um, I personally hold a great amount of optimism. Uh, I think in two years, things will look hopefully different. I think interim periods aren't designed to be easy. Um, and I think our, our financials sometimes reflect that. But I, I'd like to believe that as we get settled, um, we might see an, an uptick in pledges and income in general. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in uh, from Gail Bliss. Um, uh, says, it seems lucky that last year we asked for multi-year pledges. Uh, so how much of this year's pledging was, uh, were sustaining gifts pledged in 2019? That's a really good question. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but maybe, Cheryl, do you remember, or even um, Steve, do you remember how many of our, our current pledges are from sustainers? If I'm remembering correctly, it's something like 40% of people are sustainer, sustaining pledges, but I don't remember the exact dollar amount to date. Um, Anybody it, have that? Yeah, yeah, I just looked at quickly at the um, the database and it looks like it's about half of what we have in pledges right now. So about 50% in the dollars oh. is attributed to sustainers. That's impactful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for to the many of you that have decided to be sustaining pledgers. It does make things easier for us. Not, and one other comment so from sam and elizabeth uh they noted the email this week from susan frederick gray the um, ua president um so monica i don't know if you or maybe kelly or doug wanted to just speak to um speak to that and what our um you know what our reaction to that is and in, in terms of our plans for the full year yeah doug do you feel comfortable speaking at all to that I, what I'll just start by saying is there's still a deep level of discernment going on. Um, we're really um, looking forward to gathering together with two other congregations and an advisory team um, to, you know, gather together a couple of public health and um, physicians, as well as our administrators and ministers to think through what what the best course of action is. Um, I mean, obviously, I think we need to stay nimble because things will likely continue to change. But I think partnering around um, a plan of action is going to be uh, a key part of the next couple of weeks for us. Doug or Kelly, anything to chime into that? All I would say is that we're really trying to, um, to utilize the resources that we have available to us to think about the future um, and to prioritize, again, the safety of our community. And so the, the biggest thing that has come forward that is a, a part of Susan Frederick Gray's conversation around that is that um, we have learned um, by what we know about COVID and how, how it has passed that one of the highest risk scenarios would be gathering a large group of people in an indoor setting and asking them to spend a fair amount of time together and speak together and sing together. So there are some clear evidence that uh, wedding gatherings, funeral gatherings, worship gatherings, really it doesn't, I mean, it has nothing to do with the, of course, the style of the gathering, but that getting a lot of people into a room together is is a very high risk scenario so that that's true and we will continue to think about what that means down the down the road but that's really what inspired her comments is just that reality that we've discovered um and so it we you know it sort of leaves us to just think very carefully and to look at what happens in the future i mean the the vaccine possibility is really a, a major uh component of what 
would allow us to change that. But but we also realize that there may over time be other ways that we can be creative. But what that looks like right now, we still don't know. I also, personally, I also interpret it as, you know, just encouragement to think long term, um, it, as opposed to, you know, thinking that, quote, normal will be just around the corner. So we're, you know, we're all hearing such different things, um, you know, different, different parts of our government, government are giving different guidance. And, you know, just to continue to really, you know, really think in terms of what if um, we continue most of our activities virtually uh, for, for many months into the future. Um, yeah, so I think we can go over to the, the, those were the only ones that were um, that accumulated during the session. So we can go to uh, maybe looking at uh, hand raising. Yeah, Creel is mentioning, I think uh, um, Mark Schultz's line has their hand raised. That's on purpose. Is that a question? Hello. Yeah, no, I, I didn't hear in during the financial analysis. Uh, uh, what the current remaining mortgage balance actually is. Um, so it's wonderful in this time of low interest rate that we, we were able to do this, save some money and help with our cash flow. But then what, what is left? We have just under $3 million left. So we paid down from four mil to three mil. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll plant the seed here. The best practice that I understand around fundraising and in particular capital campaigns is that you should flex that muscle approximately every seven years. So I think, um, I hope that in a little less than seven years, we can all look forward to another capital campaign where we might be able to pay that off in, in its entirety. There are two questions uh, come in about programming. Um, one, uh, maybe if there's anyone who could expand at all on what the virtual fundraising will look like, uh, especially virtual cabaret. And also, um, what about programming for children? Um, anything, anything specifically planned, like what, what that would look like at FUS? I think you'll have to stay tuned for more information about CRE unless Kelly wants to chime in. Uh, same for fundraising. If you want to be a part of the creation of that, you should reach out to us um, because I think it's still a it's still a blank canvas. There's certainly a lot of ideas circulating, but there's an opportunity for you to leave your mark if you are interested in that arena. Kelly, any thoughts about CRE and what it may or may not look like in the fall? We just don't know at this point. Leslie sending out emails weekly to families. And so um, much depends on what the school districts decide to do. If school districts are virtual education only, um, that's gonna really impact what we decide to do here. If schools are back in person, that too will change things. So we're just, you know, we're in a really uncomfortable holding pattern right now, waiting to just see what other large organizations are doing uh, with, summer activities and then also planning for the fall. I would say from a um, from a board planning perspective, you know, I'm I'm hoping maybe we can do more in the summer than we normally do. <laughs> we aren't all disappearing to uh, <laughs> um, vacation destinations, you know, visiting family. Um, so, you know, we're whatever we're doing, it's going to be from our home base. So, um, you know, so maybe our uh, church life in general can, um, can you know, continue some of the, um, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the smaller things, you know, some of the board hosted conversations, things like that. Um, no reason to wait till fall, really, when everything's changing. Um, there was also another question, it's kind of a board thing. Um, you know, uh, someone asked um, how the pandemic will affect the third year of transition. Um, we are um, actively um, actively recruiting our next interim minister for the next year. Um, other than the fact that the pandemic brings uncertainty to everything, <laughs> um, it's it is continuing as planned. So we will have um, we will we do have very good candidates. Um, the hiring process is whirlwind. It happens in the course of about three weeks. 
um, because the um, Keith Cron and the Transitions Office um, help move that process along um, because there's just not time for a lengthy search. Um, so we will know, um, hopefully have a match of who our candidate is um, less than a week from now. It looks like Gail Bliss has her hand raised too. Gail, did you have a question? I do. I don't have an answer, but last I think it was last week at the coffee hour, we were talking about how the usual suspects seem to be the people who are showing up. And I'd like everybody to think about how we can reach out to the digitally less connected. Mark Schultz often makes a really lovely plug at this moment, but um, WMUU, um, you might tell your friends that don't have internet, but do have radio that they can listen to services on Sunday. There's one at nine and one at 11. Um, there's, there's typically, I can't remember the order, but last week's service and then the week prior. Um, and, and also, uh, assuming they have telephones, you can encourage them to call into meetings like this. You don't need a, you don't need a computer in order to see all of these shining faces. You can hear it shine through the telephone. The challenge is knowing that it's there to shine. Yeah. Which is why I'm asking everybody to think about the less digitally connected, because I can call the people I know aren't connected, but I don't know everybody who's not connected. Great point. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Monica, it looks like three other people have raised their hands. Um, Mark Schultz, his hand is raised. Lori Schwartz has a hand raised. And perhaps the other one was Gail. So Lori, can we start with you and then we'll go to Mark? Sure. Um, my question is, I'm wondering if we as a society could consider going to Gail's uh, question about how to reach out is I found the meetings, um, the virtual coffee hour with people expanding outside of our, our, our current congregation or our current uh, society to be especially um, uh, joyful while going back to, the, to our, our main group as well sometimes. So I'm wondering, because we're not limited by geography in the same way that we were, our way of growing pledges, our way of growing ourselves is to expand our circle of people that we include. So I wondered about us having um, some shared, you know, congregational uh, services uh, where we go to coffee hours together with groups and organizations that we might not otherwise or that might be interested in us so that people you know check us out become a part of us whether they become a part of us once in a while or all the time and the same for us you know not to to lose people but to uh, grow the 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 global world that uh, uh, Barack Obama and others have been speaking to So um, I was wondering, we did see a presence of, of Reeb and Prairie initially, uh, and, and now they're not taking part with us. Uh, and I'm just curious what happened. Uh, will we see them again? Uh, or maybe there was a delay for them getting their virtual offering up and running, but uh, I, I enjoyed that. And can anybody answer that question? Sure, I can chime in real quick. We, we are planning to continue the, um, the partnership. The part of the understanding was that um, worship is a way of sort of fostering your, your sense of community within your community as well. And so we alternate between those depending on the programming of the worship and also the needs of the other congregations. So, um, so they, they have their own gatherings. It took them a while to get them started, but next week's service is intentionally planned by all three congregations. And uh, the service after that, the generation service, 
will have representation from each of the congregations. So it hasn't stopped. It's just that we we have been aware that that we're trying to both allow um, us to share our resources and also to to let the other congregations continue to foster their sense of strength as their own community. So both and. I had one additional quick plug for the coffee hour. Uh, many who have not attended uh, might think it's just a room with, with 30 people, but uh, uh, we're able to uh, do breakout groups. That has really been fun. So, so Doug will set us up with 10 minutes randomly sorted. So, gee, you meet some new people, you see some old friends, and uh, we have a lot of sharing and, and bringing people up to speed on their lives. And uh, it's, that's been a really nice part of it. And I bet a lot of people are thinking, uh, they, they don't realize that the breakout group uh, is, is an important part of this. And then once we come back together after the breakout group, well, then there's a, 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 some additional sharing that comes from the topics uh, that the breakout groups had. So it's, it's a varied uh, time together uh, in terms of who you interact with. Um, I'll give a little plug for next week's coffee hour. Um, the stewardship ministry team is hoping to have um, a Q&A um, so that we could answer questions on the work we're doing behind the scenes. This, this is like Rachel. another question from Rachel. There you go, Rachel. Go ahead. Uh, typical, more of a comment. Um, so I'm also involved. I've been running the Zoom worship services at Reeb. So I'm a member of uh, both places. And um, I know that we have seen people coming to the coffee hour, that people that had moved away. But like one couple, they moved to Rochester and their church, they couldn't get their Zoom to work this morning, so they knew they could hop on our service. So I think there's a lot of value in reaching out to people who might have moved out of town because FUS has, has, FUS has tremendous resources, has great streaming services, um, and you know, not every church is able to do this right now. Um, and FUS has these great resources, and I think it's a great time to reach out to people who have, you know, especially if they've moved pretty recently, it might feel more comfortable to come back to the people they know, do the coffee hour there, um, and maybe see some pledges out of that. So we've definitely seen that um, from running the Reeb services. We had like 60 people this morning, it was crazy. Um, and we had no trouble getting quorum for our congregational meetings, it's a gross day outside. So anyway, so we're seeing some benefits there. So I'm hope, hoping that FUS sees some of that too. Does anyone else have a virtual hand raised? I don't think so. I don't see anyone else. Okay. Any other final questions before we do a closing reading? All right. Doug? Our up. closing reading is taken from Unitarian Minister Teresa Soto. In this community, we hold hope close. We don't always know what comes next, but that cannot dissuade us. We don't always know just what to do, but that will not mean that we are lost in the wilderness. We rely on the certainty beneath, the foundation of our values and ethics. We are the people who return to love like a North Star and to the truth that is greater together than we are alone. Our hope does not live in some glimmer of an indistinct future. Rather, we know the way to the world of which we dream, and by covenant and the movement forward of one right action in the next, we know that one day we will arrive home. Thanks, everyone, for our time together today. So oh, good to see you. Join us on May 31st. We'll see you at the first meeting, if not sooner. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Monica, Doug, and Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All Bye. of you. Bye. Bye.